I wrote my script for the sermon, I wrote something that we just read this morning. You know, um, I told about my journey last time that we set a destination on Google Maps and went in the wrong direction. But I did not lose my complete faith in Google. Uh, so when Sheba was here and she found uh, a home and she gave me the address where we would be staying, I started my search and my first search was for the church because I wanted to make sure that uh, when I go I should know where I'm going uh, to be uh, to worship and interestingly uh, this was the only church somehow I was convinced beforehand even before coming to London that I should go and be a part of this church and uh, so as soon as I came, first thing I told my wife, because first uh, Sunday she had to go on her duty, so it was just me and Salome. Uh, and we came walking uh, first day, but then from that day onwards, um, we felt like we are uh, a part of the family. And it always felt like being part of a church the way we have uh, back in India. So. Uh, and it's interesting that same thing was read uh, here. So it is indeed uh, the Lord's confirmation to all of us that the way we are, we have been in the past, the way we are, we should continue to be a family and a group of friends that we are and help each other to grow in God's word. Today is Palm Sunday. Right? And uh, it's, it's nice to be standing here and it's nice to be sharing from God's word. Now if I am preaching on a Palm Sunday and if I don't preach on Palm Sunday, I will have a hard time explaining my mom why I didn't do that. <laughs> it, it's partly so because uh, my grandfather was uh, a pastor. He served in a village church for about 50 years of his life. And the same thing has been taken by my mom. So we often discuss, I know I often discuss my sermons with her and she often discusses her sermons with me and we talk a lot about it. So, in fact, that's one of the pressures why I'm also speaking on Palm Sunday. But I think that's the most appropriate thing to do on this day, to turn back to that event that took place on Palm Sunday and learn a few elements that we can learn from the things that took place on that day. Now, uh, the reading that we would be focusing on today's, uh, for today's sermon is from John's Gospel, chapter 12, uh, verse 12 to 19. And I will read it from you, uh, for you. It says in John Gospel, John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 12 onwards, the next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's coat. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, There is nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. During uh, Christmas or Easter, one of the interesting things that I like to do is to observe the involvement of various people that are mentioned in the Bible. And uh, as we 
uh, meditate on this passage, that is what we are going to do. We are going to look at the various groups of people or various individuals who were involved in that event or in the triumphal entry of Jesus and we would compare them with none other than ourselves and see what we can learn from them or what we uh, what similarities or differences we find when we talk about them. Now in order to understand the events that led to the triumphal entry, you know there is a lot of history that has to be understood. I am a very bad history teacher. So I am not going to uh, get you a lot of details but yes, there are certain parts that we need to understand. A big difference that we see when we open a New Testament or when the curtains are raised up in the New Testament that socially the whole scenario of Jerusalem has changed. Now when the Old Testament closes in uh, Nehemiah historically, we see the group of people has written, the temple was rebuilt, people were not, very, the, old, the older people were not very happy about the temple that was built, but then they were within their city, the town uh, was built, the walls were built and Nehemiah and Ezra did that, restoration of Jerusalem. But then when we open the uh, Bible in Matthew, we see the temple is much larger, it's much grander than what it was. The Jerusalem was a well-built city, it was well-established uh, city by then, it had its own king, Herod was the king for, Israel, uh, for Jerusalem and the land of Israel. There was a religious order that was established. They were not just high priests now, they were Pharisees and Sadducees in the religious order and things had changed a lot from what they were at the end of Old Testament and when we enter in New Testament because there is a period of how many years between two Testament? 400 years, right? But that's good about all the Baptist churches. They, they make feel preachers that you know everything. Yeah? Well, even back in India, if a question is thrown to the congregation, they will be just looking at us like this. And it makes preachers feel nice. Oh, I know everything. <laughs> but I know we know all. We, we know it all. So, and in this 400 years, Lord had changed. So, when we come to the event of the triumphal entry, it was with a lot of different things, a lot of previous experiences that people took part there. Now, there were mainly three, group of, three groups that were involved in uh, the whole event of triumphal entry. And the first and the foremost and the largest group was a general crowd. Now we need to understand that just before the triumphal entry of Jesus took place, now this was not the first time that Jesus had come to Jerusalem and neither this was last because in his last week he went often went to Bethany and then came back to Jerusalem. That's, uh, that he did because uh, he had friends there. And who were his friends in Bethany? Lazarus. Martha and Mary. So just before his triumphal entry, Jesus had done something that had got everyone's attention. As, as we have read, uh, read in the scripture, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And apparently because of this, he was the most talk about topic in uh, the people, among the people that day, uh, uh, during that time. If it would have been Twitter, it would have been the most trending talk. <laughs> the hashtag. Lazarus dead from the... Uh, Lazarus dead from the dead. Jesus rose a dead man. And there would have been a lot of opinions, a lot of discussions. I, I like reading reactions. You know, uh, I enjoy... In, in fact, in India back now, uh, central elections are going on. And po political parties are doing a lot of things. But what I enjoy the most is going to the, going down to the comment section 
and reading what people, the expertise have to say. And it's interesting. You know, it is, it may, like, the world that right now we are living is so much opinionated that we don't know anything and yet we give our opinion so confidently. <laughs> and that's surprising uh, for me to see. And I enjoy those opinions. <laughs> but then, when Jesus was going into Jerusalem that day, there was a huge crowd that was there in and around Jerusalem. And that crowd had gathered for one very reason. And that was a celebration of Passover. <coughs> now, we all know what Passover is, or I suppose we all know what Passover is. Uh, I know we are a Baptist church. And you would like to me, if you, you would like me to feel good about it. But what is Passover? It's our last Saturday. <laughs> uh, just a quick reminder, Passover started during the slavery when, Israel, the, when the people of Israel were in slavery of Egyptians, right? And God told, uh, communicated through Moses that you should cut a lamp, put on the sign by the blood of that lamp on the doorpost so that angel will come and pass over and no one would be harmed in the house. And after this event, people of Israel were freed from the slavery uh, from the Egyptians. And it was one of the most important celebration for Jewish people. And it was mandatory for them to come to Jerusalem for that celebration. So the crowd that had come in Jerusalem was there to celebrate Passover. <coughs> Interestingly, even though Jerusalem was burnt built city, it couldn't accommodate so many people. Now, it, uh, when I was uh, referring to commentaries, it says the, the number of people present in Jerusalem during Passover would be three to five times more than the normal population of Jerusalem. So it was impossible for a city like Jerusalem to accommodate so many people. So people stayed on the outskirts of city and outskirts when I say that you know if you look at the map we have Bethany a town where Jesus friends were staying a town where Jesus performed a miracle then we have we had Bethphage another town a very close by town where uh, commentators say or the input <coughs> says that uh, I think in one of the gospels it is mentioned that they got a donkey and a colt from Bedfoge. They were at the foothill of Mount Olive. And next to the Mount Olive, uh, between the Mount Olive and Jerusalem, was Kidron Valley. And this was a preferred location for all these visitors to make their temporary arrangements to stay. And Jesus was traveling from Bethany through Mount Olive and to Jerusalem. So the crowd that was present there was residing there temporarily so that they can celebrate Passover. Now, this is this one thing is very interesting that we should note. Many times in our life we think, oh, when God will make things happen, they would be miraculous. That would be sudden, that would be great. I would be able to realize at very first instance that God does this. God did this. Sorry for that. But then God does things in our life in such a natural succession that He does it even when we don't realize it. Oh, it's a God's doing. And sadly with the advancement in the science and technology, most of the time we call it coincidences. And we don't realize that it's God's doing. So the whole event of Palm Sunday or the Easter week went on so naturally that people were not able to realize that it is what has been told is going to happen. And we would come to that after a while. So when Jesus decided to go in Jerusalem that day, people were already talking about it. People were already discussing about 
the last verse, people are already discussing about what had happened. So when Jesus rode on a donkey, his disciples took out his clothes and uh, kept it on the street. And people saw that. But then people keeping out those clothes on the street, giving out those palm branches, shouting, they were all enjoying being there. But then there was one major problem with the crowd. Their expectations from Christ was not right. Now as I have told you that they were under uh, the bondage of Romans and Romans were politically, uh, Romans were ruling them. So there was no freedom for them. And when they looked at Christ, a, a man who could perform miracle, who could raise man from a death, so for them he could do anything. And for a crowd that was looking for a liberation, a crowd that was looking for a freedom, he was a right man to follow. He was a right man to be, to encourage, to be encouraged. He was a right man to whom they can support so that he can free them from the slavery of Roman people. And with that, a lot of people were shouting. A lot of people were present there to held him as a king and the scripture also mentions that since he had performed miracle lot of them were also there to see what more he can do and that's the reason they were there that's the reason they were shouting that's the reason they were willing to give uh, to <coughs> keep the clothes on the street so that he can be honored so that they will gain something from him. And that is something that we see of this crowd. Now it would be very wrong to say that the whole crowd present on that day turned completely back and uh, on Good Friday. A part of it did, yes. A part of this crowd was also there on Good Friday shouting, crucify him and leave Grambas. Just because the expectations from Christ were not fulfilled. Just because the Messiah that they were thinking of, the king that they were thinking of, was not the king in their imagination, but he was a king that they failed to understand. And many times in our Christian life, Many times in our Christian work, we do keep such wrong expectations from God that when we don't see those things being fulfilled, we sometimes tend to get angry with God. I have seen many young people who say, I did so many things, but God has not heard God has not fulfilled. I wanted this. I wanted that. I wanted to be here. I wanted to be there. One of the young per uh, person in my church that is always in my mind, uh, you know, he was a very young man. I'm um, sorry, a very intelligent man, a uh, boy. And he came from a poor family. But he wanted to be an... Uh, pilot. And somehow he prayed for that a lot. He worked hard for, uh, worked hard for that. But there was certain sum uh, that he, the sum, certain amount that he was supposed to uh, be paying to get admission for being a pilot in an Air Force of India. And his family couldn't afford that. And since he couldn't get things done, he got or he broke away so much that he stopped coming to church he stopped praying to God he got into bad habits and well it, it hurt me a lot to see him lying down on the street after uh, being drunk 
Many times he used to stand in front of the church shouting and yelling about church, about God. And he is one extreme example. But don't we show our anger on God when we see our expectations not being fulfilled? When we see that we wanted something from God and God did not listen to our prayers? And this crowd was also expecting the same. And since the expectations were not fulfilled, some of them went and turned their back on him. Second interesting group that was a part of that crowd were the Pharisees. Now we read uh, in the passage that then the Pharisees said to each other, there is nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Now Pharisees were uh, religious teachers in the Jewish community. Now. Uh, we don't see much of them in Old Testament and there were the new, uh, intertestamental development in a religious order that took place. So, Pharisees were the teachers of the law. They had the law, the Old Testament with them. Because during the intertestamental period, the Bible, the Old Testament had taken its form. So, they had the whole Old Testament with them. Or most of the Old Testament with that. But this religious group, hey, you can help me shout Hosanna, Hosanna, come. <laughs> uh, but this religious group were after saving their own chairs, were, uh, after saving their own agenda and were after making sure that their privileges remain. Now we also need to understand that the religious group, the high priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, even though they were just a religious group, they enjoyed a political power in Jerusalem during that time. Now if you want to uh, just to get a hint of their political power, read a story on good, about Good Friday, the things that happened on Good Friday. She was telling me yesterday, I will be missing your sermon, so good that she came. <laughs> uh, you know, the, they pressurized Pilate. Now, Pilate was the one who was in charge, who was much more powerful than Herod, the king, the Sadducees and Pharisees. He was in charge, a superior than them. But then they forced him to change his decision to crucify Barabbas and instead opt for Jesus on crucifixion. So when Pharisees, when Sadducees, when high priests, now if we read a passage, passage uh, just above uh, what we read in chapter 11 uh, of John's Gospel, we see that all these religious leaders are coming together and planning to kill Jesus. Now, for them, Jesus was a threat. He was threat to them, not just because he was condemning everything that they were doing. You know, the story of Good Samaritan. He, he called them whitewashed tombs. But he was, he, they looked at him as a threat, even when they thought of him as a Messiah who would free people from the slavery. Because as soon as a freedom would take place, their prestigious position, their prestige in the society, the freedom that they enjoyed, the authority that they enjoyed would be endangered. And that's where they looked at him as a threat. So they did not want, the, so, so they wanted Christ to move away from the social scenario so that their status would continue to grow, their power would continue to grow. So for them, Jesus was a threat. And for Pharisees, their focus was wrong. Sadly, Pharisees, Sadducees and the high priest order, the priestly orders, should have been the first one to recognize the real Messiah. And they should have been the ones to proclaim He is the Messiah who is going to free us from our sins. 
But then, since their focus was wrong, since they, they were wanting to safeguard their own focuses, they couldn't see beyond themselves. The third group, who, which was a part of the procession or the triumphal entry, were the disciples. And it is one of the most interesting groups. Now, the, uh, in John Gospels it says, His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, this is not the first time that it has been said regarding disciples that they were not able to understand. When Jesus calmed the storm, it says they were scared. When Jesus feed 5,000, they were still puzzled. And they failed to understand Jesus every time. Now, they were the ones who were with Jesus in, uh, uh, on, like, sorry. They were with Jesus in each day of his life from the time they were called. They saw him praying, they heard his teaching, they heard his parables, they saw almost everything that he did and yet they couldn't understand that this man and I'm saying a man because they were yet to understand that he is the son of God even when he told that I am going to die even when he told that I am a son of God and they couldn't understand they saw they must be still wondering for, for some time they must be thinking, wow, we made a good choice by following Christ. Now when he becomes a king, I would be his deputy. Now I, would, I might get some good place. And they fail to understand. But John writes that when he entered into his glory, when Christ's ascension took place, they were able to understand that all that had happened was prophesied, all that had happened was understood by us in a completely wrong way. And they got a right understanding of Christ. You know, what's the difference between those disciples, those who are following Christ and us? They were yet to receive Holy Spirit and we have already received the Holy Spirit. And if we are still failing to understand the things that takes place in our lives. And if we still fail to understand the doings of the Lord in our life, I think we need to stop and think of our lives. We need to think of those moments in our life that we still sometimes are puzzled about. We still sometimes ask ourselves and say, Oh, how did that happen? And we need to start identifying the presence of the Lord, the doings of the Lord in our life. And the last thing that I would like to talk about, the last person, a God who was involved there, was Christ. Now it is easy to say, Christ was God. So he knew he was here for that. So he going to Jerusalem was not a big deal because he wanted to fulfill it. But I think the whole pinnacle of his confusion, the whole pinnacle of his fear of man and God we see when he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. There was a struggle. Now even when Christ uh, now it is, it is an assumption. Maybe when he, when, when he was going to Jerusalem, he must be having conflict. Should I or should I not? Because he knew what is going to come. He knew that when I go to Jerusalem I will have to go and die on the cross. <coughs> but friends, mm -hmm. he was willing to do that. He was ready. He was preparing himself to do, to pay the cost that he was here for. And on this Palm Sunday, are we like the crowd that still looks at God with the wrong expectations and then we get angry? Are we like Pharisees 
who looked at Christ, who had a scripture, who could have understood, but then they were so involved within themselves that they didn't want it to look beyond themselves. Are we like disciples? That they had Jesus. Jesus was their best friend. They saw what he did and yet couldn't understand. But friends, I think the need of our today, and even uh, as we talk about the turning that is coming, is being willing to do whatever it costs. Because Christ did for us whatever it costs. And he went to Jerusalem. He fulfilled what he was here for. And he offered freedom to all of us. And as we celebrate Palm Sunday, or as we observe the Palm Sunday, are we willing to go out for the Christ? Are we willing to go out like disciples did when they realized what Christ was here for and offer our life as a testimony? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come at your feet at this time of day. Lord, we thank you for your willingness. Your willingness to lay your life for our sins, Lord. Your willingness to enter into Jerusalem even when you knew what is going to happen. And Lord, we thank you for your love in our life. Lord, we pray that you help us to grow in a way that we would continue to love you, Lord. We would be not looking at you with the wrong expectations. We would be not involved so much within ourselves that we would fail to look at you and understand your presence in our life. But Lord, we want to understand your presence in our life, Lord. We want to understand your doings in our life, Lord. So that we would, like disciples, go out and share your word to others, Lord. So that our life would become a living testimony, Lord. So that people would look at us and say, look, he believes in Christ. And Lord, let that be a testimony for our lives, Lord. Lord, we thank you once again, Lord. Because you were willing for us, for me, to go to Jerusalem. We thank you once again. In Jesus' precious name we pray. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.